Today on UW 360, meet the UW alum who's helping transform military veterans' lives one student at a time. Plus another UW grad who's out to change the world by turning sewage into clean water. Also a look back at the Everett Massacre and how that century-old tragedy is still affecting Washington workers today. And strike up the band as we meet the man who keeps the Husky Band marching. Hi everyone, from the University of Washington, I'm Carolyn Douglas. Welcome to UW 360. The University of Washington takes great pride in supporting our military veterans through its many veteran programs and initiatives on campus. But one UW alum is earning great acclaim for his work with student veterans on another campus. Chris Zarek is a Navy veteran and the founding director of the Veterans Resource Center at Edmonds Community College where his husky pride and his passion for helping fellow veterans are setting a shining example for others. There's something about going from something that's very structured to something that is more of an individualistic view. Um, I'm learning to become an individual again. Tucked in the heart of the bustling Edmonds Community College campus sits both a resource and a refuge for military veterans. Here, I don't have to fear anything. I can speak my mind and we can be open and share our opinions and how to accomplish our goals. You still have that card I gave you? I sure do. At EdCC's Veterans Resource Center, someone's always ready to lend an ear, offer some advice, share a joke, or just grab a stiff cup of joe freshly brewed by the center's director, U.S. Navy veteran and chief coffee maker, Chris Zarek. Yeah, our coffee's pretty much famous. It's Navy coffee. You can stand a four cup in it, from what I've been told. And, uh, Chris spent 20 good. years traveling the world as a CB, the Navy's version of the Army Corps of Engineers. After retiring from the military, he looked at colleges around the country to continue his education and chose the University of Washington. He spent his first quarter at EdCC and then transferred to UW. Midway through my quarter here at Edmonds, I got this wonderful purple envelope in the mail. Uh, they said I had been accepted to the University of Washington and I was so excited. <laughs> just type in records. And he earned both his BA and MBA from the UW. Well, I'm very proud of you, you know that. And then eventually returned to EdCC and applied for the job of director of the campus's new Veterans Resource Center. I thought it'd be really neat to have a place where veterans can meet other veterans because there's a special bond between veterans and um, it's so important in the transition process to know that you're not alone. Sometimes you just have to like stare at it. And the evidence of Chris's good work is everywhere. From the dozens of students swinging by every day to work and socialize, to the shining recognitions adorning the center's walls, to the passing and yet powerful conversations happening in the halls. So thank you again, sir. Got you, man. God bless you. God bless you too, man. It's the stories and it's the people, you know. It's um, and it's seeing guys like, like Jeff that had a really tough go of it, and um, yeah, and, and seeing them persevere on in their education, and then eventually, I get to see them go on to great things in life. From building bridges to rebuilding lives, it's clear this proud CB and Husky has found the mission of his life. You know, it was a great opportunity to help veterans, which is something that. You know, deep in my heart, I always wanted to do. And I'm doing it. I'm living the dream. <laughs> Many of those EdCC students will go on to complete their degrees at one of the UW campuses, where they'll also find strong support, like at the UW's new Office of Student Veterans Life. For more information, just head to the link on our website. Still to come, meet the man behind the band who helps keep the Husky Marching Band in tune and in step. Also, see how a new competition has sparked innovative ideas from UW students to improve medical practices around our world. Plus, another innovation from a UW grad that's helping transform lives overseas by tackling one of the biggest problems in our world as UW 360 continues. The following UW 360 story is made possible by the generous support of BECU. BECU, more than just money.
Welcome back to UW 360. Every day, countless cities and communities around the world struggle to get clean, safe water. And every day, one University of Washington graduate is getting closer and closer to solving that crisis. Peter Janicki has come up with a way to transform raw sewage into clean drinking water. Stacy Sakamoto brings us the story. Yeah, what do we get done today? We're a creative bunch up here. We do a lot of different kinds of things. Let me see the oil side of it. Can you bring it up and let me take a look at the oil part of it? Meet UW Masters in Mechanical Engineering graduate Peter Janicki. Where's the valve that you're using for getting the steam coming in? Founder and owner of Janicki okay. Industries. When's it going to be right? <laughs> Their home office is in tiny Cedro Woolley, Washington. Their work from marine and aerospace is all around the world. We work on so many new technologies that were like, hey, I wonder if these guys can work in sanitation. More exact, taking that sanitation and turning it into clean water. And what I concluded is that there was only one technical solution that could work, and that was to evaporate the water. Janicki Bioenergy developed a self-powered filtering system called an omniprocessor. That system takes raw sludge and transforms it into clean water clean enough to drink. You know, we have a little steam power plant, and making a steam power plant that's really efficient on this scale, that was pretty creative. We start with liquid waste. We feed it into what we call the evaporator or the dryer. And in that piece of equipment, we have hot metal surfaces that the material is in contact with, and we boil the water out of the solids. Those solids are used as fuel to power the omniprocessor itself. Water vapors are run through more filters, removing chemical agents and aromas. Finally, the water vapors are sent through a condenser and returned to a liquid state, clean, filtered water. The engineering was tremendous, and it took a lot of really smart people to kind of put it all together in the end. In addition to Janicki, many of his smart people also have University of Washington roots. I've been very closely in contact with a lot of the professors in the mechanical engineering department. They're great mentors of mine. These people really inspired me, and they have inspired a lot of um, people that work for me. We're seeing really good removal lately. We've been the environment of innovation that Janicki fosters requires a new way of thinking. So I have to reprogram most of the engineers that I get out of school. Innovation happens through breaking things, through uh, frustrations especially working on something that you don't know how to do, because that's how you innovate. And that requires really special people to do that. Janicki Bioenergies has one omniprocessor already in operation in Dakar, with plans for a second unit in 2018. And when you look at it, it seems overwhelmingly complex, but in reality, it's not that complicated. It's actually quite simple. Peter Janicki is a big thinker, fostering a company of ideas that promise to impact the world. I look at things like, you know, Edison's Menlo Park, a research and development facility that has thousands of scientists, chemists, physicists, all these people developing all this amazing technology here and then deploying it around the world. That is my vision. That is my dream. Since arriving in Dakar, the Omni processor has gone through tons of waste and can now process it at a rate of about 4,000 tons a year. That's enough to treat the waste produced by a community of up to 100,000 people. That pilot project has a life expectancy of about 20 years or more and may well prove to have life-changing results for the people of Senegal. All right, from one innovation to another. This one out of the UW Business School, where a new competition could soon help improve medical practices around the world. One winning team has already started a futuristic new company, and another is working on a $3 replacement for a prescription drug that currently costs hundreds of dollars. I don't even know what to say right now. Um, I'm just really, really thankful, really ecstatic that I even have this opportunity to be here. Neither profit nor politics entered in these graduate students' minds when they thought up the winning entry at the 2017 Holloman Health Innovation Challenge. Their entry 
Epi for All is a self-administered, reusable allergy injector. So when this is pressed against the thigh, these prongs right here will push on the spring. The idea began as a class assignment. So it didn't actually start as a business idea. It started as an idea to save preventable deaths. Initially, we were just looking to target these low-resource countries internationally, but then we started to see the need arise more in America. So the engineering students kept working. We're the first ampule-based auto-injector. So that means when our drug expires every 18 months, instead of throwing out the entire device for 650 bucks, we can just replace this ampule of epinephrine, and this only costs 50 cents. That would be a huge cost breakthrough. Epi for All, made largely of plastic and springs, is expected to be made available for just a few dollars in developing countries by 2018. And I'm just really excited to see where this goes. So we can adjust the cap segment to a fuller length. Playgate is a non-electronic exoskeleton that's affordable for families, and it's meant to help kids with cerebral palsy and other kind of neurological walking disorders learn to walk and get practice outside of therapy. Months after Playgate's second place finish in the Holloman Health Challenge, this student design is ready to begin tests at local hospitals and clinics. So this, with the natural action of our tendon that comes from the hip to the knee to the ankle, it stores and returns energy during walking so the kids are upright, and then they shift weight off their hip, and this guides their leg forward with the right range of motion. One year after winning the 2016 challenge, Silene Biotech is a new business in the tiny field of personal cell preservation. We specifically work with induced pluripotent stem cells. We can process them and isolate the necessary cells, and then we can store them long-term for future use with the thought that your younger cells are better for future use because they're less aged and mutated. Working from two different buildings at the UW, Silene coordinates and processes the blood saving stem cells before sending them for cold storage in the Midwest. So currently people are using uh, patients' own white blood cells to treat their cancer. This is called cell therapy. There are other clinical trials out there for diseases like heart disease, spinal cord injury, type 1 diabetes, and even Parkinson's. So um, there's a lot of therapies that are going to come online using regenerative medicine. So there's a lot of potential to regrow tissues and organs. And again, we hear that the business would not have been possible without many mentors and benefactors, both on and off campus. For students out there who think that, you know, maybe these competitions are just something to do, you can learn a lot, you can gain a lot of experience, but you can also start companies out of these competitions. Some of the students who have entered the Holloman Health Competitions are members of the UW student-led group Bioengineers Without Borders. That group's mission is to develop low-cost, sustainable medical technologies and to provide students an opportunity for real-world professional experience. Still ahead, how the UW is helping preserve the memories of a century-old labor clash in Everett and the painful lessons learned from the Everett Massacre. Also, a sneak peek at the man behind the band who keeps all those husky musicians marching with pride as UW360 continues. Support for UW360 is provided by the Labor Archives of Washington. Learn more about researching at the Labor Archives and donating collections at laborarchives.org. Welcome back to UW360. Washington State has a rich history of progressive activism, and that history has just hit an impressive milestone. To tell the story, producer Austin Seedentoff boarded a boat to relive the 100th anniversary of an event that helped shape the history of Washington and shows us how the UW is helping keep that history alive. It's a blustery day at the Port of Everett, and wind claws at the surface of Puget Sound, while a small crowd gathers on the dock, waiting. The voyage today commemorates the 100th anniversary of one of the most significant events in Washington state labor history and Washington history. Finally, a steamer, the Virginia Five, pulls into port, fighting wind and wave, its passengers singing labor songs, their voices barely carrying over the water. 
So in 1916, the Verona, very much like the Virginia today, part of the Mosquito Fleet, uh, pulled into Everett Bay, heading for the dock. The uh, clash between the IWW and the authorities at Everett uh, took the lives of at least seven people, maybe 12, 13. A century ago, the Industrial Workers of the World, or Wobblies, took a boat to support striking shingle workers in Everett. They never made it. Local authorities started shooting them in cold blood before they could even dock. The Everett Massacre, um, you know, embodies, you know, the principles and values that lay behind that, that the workers and the Wobblies uh, uh, carried out, um, you know, are the same values and principles that we need to do today to move our society forward. The shingle weavers, handy and wise. Washington State Labor Council President Jeff Johnson takes today's voyage to honor the lives lost and keep the Wobblies' ideals alive. They knew that when they were beaten back over and over again, that they had a constitutional right to speak their minds and to speak that it was okay to speak truth to power, right? And to, to speak out for decent wages and decent working conditions and for a fair share. Would you have mentions of gold in the sky? The IWW knew how to use a disaster like this to organize. They did everything possible to teach about the Everett Massacre and to create a memory that comes on through us today. There is power, there is power. If you don't remember your history, you're doomed to repeat it. So there's the way in which the radical reputation of Washington State in general has been reproduced partly because of very uh, highly publicized dramatic moments that have to do with what uh, organized labor has done here. Why Washington is a blue state instead of a red state, that has everything to do with labor history. We're going to fight to make sure that we have gender and pay equity, right? The presence of a very strong labor movement here helps shape the state's identity. And so University of Washington students do have opportunities to learn about labor history. And the Labor Archives now uh, preserves and uh, promotes labor history. The Wobbly story is recorded at the UW Labor Archives, where you can find a collection of postcards made by the IWW for outreach and fundraising after the massacre. Those postcards and more are also available through the digital archives online. Straight ahead, the man whose job it is to keep the Husky marching band marching. And with hundreds of instruments to take care of, you can imagine that's no easy task. His labor of love when UW 360 continues. Welcome back to UW360. It's considered one of the greatest shows on earth, or at least one of the greatest marching bands on earth. The world famous UW Husky Marching Band has been firing up fans for more than 80 years. And for the past 15 years, the band has had a secret weapon to help maintain its edge, its very own repair technician, who makes sure each and every instrument is show ready for game time. <laughs> It has been the rhythm of Husky Nation since 1929. The brassy and beloved UW Husky Marching Band. The 240 member ensemble keeps fans jumping at football games and pep rallies. But before all this can happen, a whole lot of this has to happen behind the scenes. Got some dents and creases here that we're gonna Gonna work out. Ben Gary is the man who keeps those husky musicians marching. For well over a decade now, he's been the guy who smooths the dents, replaces the pads, fixes the mouthpieces, and whatever else comes his way. Yep, that one's good to go. I gave Ben a call and said, listen, Ben, we gotta have you, and thankfully he's been with us ever since. It was a unique offer. Few colleges have their own on-site band repair technician. And the part-time schedule was the perfect fit for this golf-loving retiree. I'm really lucky to have a job that I enjoy and a job that uh, I have flexible hours in. 
particularly in January, February, and March. A typical game day finds Ben arriving five hours before kickoff to repair dents and dings from the pep rally the night before and any other last minute repairs before game time. Clarinets, he says, are the easiest to maintain. Sousaphones, on the other hand, are not his friend. Those son of a guns weigh 35 pounds. And when you put them over a dent ball or dent whatever I'm working on and work the, the dents out, it's hard on the back. <laughs> and he takes great pride in watching his kids perform. That's true. Very, very true. It's very, very rewarding. We could not get along without him. The Husky Marching Band. Brad McDavid says having Ben on staff gives the Husky Marching Band an enormous edge over the competition, even when he's been known to help the competition. I've loaned him out for a few seconds to fix their instrument because um, they, you know, it's just so rare that a marching band staff would have someone like him um, available, especially on game day. You loaned him to the competition? Well, he didn't tell me that until after the fact. But <laughs> but I'm still waiting on the check from Alabama and Colorado. <laughs> but clearly no hard feelings here, just a lot of love and respect. There's so much technique involved. Um, that we are so blessed to have him, and I told him he better never retire. <laughs> Brad keeps telling me that I have to stay in shape enough to do this until he retires from being the Husky Marching Band Director. I'm not sure I'm going to last that long, but <laughs> he would like to see that happen. And no doubt, so would the rest of Husky Nation. <laughs> Ben says when it comes to retiring, he's just taking it year by year. He clearly loves his work and is deeply grateful for his job, except when it comes to hoisting those darn sousaphones around. And that does it for this edition of UW360. If you'd like more information on any of the stories you saw today, just head to our website at uwtv.org slash uw360. You'll also find us on Facebook and Twitter. I'm Carolyn Douglas. Thank you for watching. And we'll see you next time with all new stories from the University of Washington.